Leo Panitch is, I'm sure, pretty well known in this room. Um, I've known Leo a long time, too. He is a distinguished research professor in political science, a Canada Research Chair in Comparative Political Economy at York. And since 1985, many of you will know that he has been the co-editor of Socialist Register, uh, a publication that I'm sure many of you are familiar with. His focus is on global capitalism, which appears in many of his writings, most recently his 2012 book, The Making of Global Capitalism, The Political Economy of American Empire, written with his colleague Sam Gibbon, who unfortunately could not be here uh, as scheduled earlier because of a family emergency. And that book has won several prizes, including the Deutscher Memorial Prize in the UK. And Leo is going to talk about socialism and intellectuals in historical perspective, the Canadian example. I'm not going to say anything nice about Brian. Uh, I already did that, as Greg Keeley can attest, that in Ottawa in June at a Canadian Historical Association panel in his honor. Uh, so that's enough, right? <laughs> uh, Never enough. <laughs> uh, Emmanuel Wallerstein once came to York University uh, when he was just finishing a report he had been commissioned to do by the Gulbenkian Foundation on the Tower of Babel that had been made of the social sciences. Uh, you know, and he said, uh, back in the 19th century, there was some um, other disciplines, economics, sociology, anthropology. And through the course of the 20th century, and especially after World War II, very heavily sponsored by the American state, you got this explosion of area studies and uh, et cetera, and he listed them all. Uh, a anthropologist at York, Malcolm Blinko, a Marxist anthropologist, uh, got up and said, you know, you've named every intellectual uh, discipline in the world, but you didn't say anything about Marxism. And Wallerstein said, well, you know, until the 1960s, if you were a Marxist, you went into a revolutionary party. You didn't go into the university. So I want to take that as my theme. Uh, in Canada, uh, for a very long time, uh, the universities didn't want you if you were a Marxist. Fernand Zanostri's muckraking book on uh, Mackenzie King tells us that in 1895, a student club had invited a socialist speaker on name, uh, and the economist James Maver, a very famous uh, UT economist, uh, barred him from the campus. Uh, I like to think that that speaker was uh, probably Philip Thompson, uh, uh, who, uh, you know, has been editor of the Labour Advocate in Toronto since the 1870s, wrote a book called The Politics of Labour, is more in the United States than in Canada. Uh, he was channeling a lot of Chartism still with his uh, calls for recall. Uh, etc. Uh, Ian Mackay goes through that very nicely. Uh, at that time, uh, in the 1870s, he, you know, had some notions, apart from Spencer's notions of evolution, of, of uh, labor capital amity, but by the 1990s he was pretty much into class struggle. But McKay also tells us that at that time in the 90s he was president of the Toronto Nationalist Club and points to the irony uh, of an American uh, living in Canada uh, being a, as he calls it, socialist nationalist. Uh, uh, and, and I think that it's uh, one of the interesting things, one might, as McKay says, that one might think about, and relevant to say with all of you Americans in the room, uh, that being a socialist in Canada also means having a high degree of sensitivity uh, to the American Empire and its effects in Canada. Uh, even Trotskyists like Wayne Roberts uh, <laughs> were known to think that was something that was important to see. Uh, and in Sam's in my book, of course, we talk about the uh, contemporary form of American imperialism around the world being a form of Canadianization, an informal imperialism of uh, incorporation. Okay. Uh, 
Engels was here in the late 1880s. Visited Niagara. Uh, in fact, once when I was there, I saw his signature. Uh, in, it's no longer there in the old Niagara Falls Museum, uh, which is now closed down. Uh, and he wrote a letter from Canada saying, talking about the sleepy Canada against this very dynamic America right across uh, the, uh, he was coming up to St. Lawrence as he was writing this letter, right across the river. Uh, and he predicted before long, not only the farmers of Manitoba, but the businessmen of Kingston would be uh, trying to uh, join the United States. Uh, that, of course, didn't happen, uh, and it has also something to do, I think, with what it uh, involves being a socialist uh, and a socialist intellectual in Canada. Uh, originally, uh, there were very few, unlike the United States and, and Britain and elsewhere, very few intellectuals of the traditional sort uh, who could be said to be socialists in Canada. You know, whereas in Britain you had playwrights, famously poets, novelists, uh, by the beginning of the 20th century, uh, who thought of themselves as socialists and joined socialist organizations. That was, I think, much less the case uh, at that time. Uh, uh, there were uh, clerics, there you may not have been poets and playwrights, there were priests, although they were of the Protestant denomination almost uh, entirely. Uh, and much has been written about the social gospel in that respect. Um, I, I thought that Wayne's reference to seeing Tommy Douglas give his last uh, uh, speech at a Baptist church was in that sense really interesting. And very famously, of course, um, uh, J.S. Woodsworth uh, goes on to be the founder of Canadian social democracy. Initially, uh, these Christian socialists were speaking to Christians. They were mainly speaking inside the church. I went back and picked up my copy. I'm not a bibliophile like Brian is, but I do have some uh, pretty early editions of My Neighbor and so on. And I picked up My Neighbor, it was a book from 1911, and it ends uh, by speaking to Christians. It ends speaking to the church. Through the course of World War I, not only Woodsworth, but other social gospel people, would turn outwards to speak to workers and farmers much more than to their congregation with regard to the social ills of capitalism. Uh, and of course, with the Winnipeg General Strike uh, and uh, with the farmer revolt and farmer organizations that are formed after World War I, you see people like Woodsworth and Irvine uh, making that their institutional home. Um, in fact, in 1918, with the Russian Revolution, uh, it, uh, and the same in 1918 with the British Labour Party uh, putting into its constitution its clause four, famous clause four commitment to the social ownership of the means of production, distribution, exchange. Uh, Woodsworth writes, uh, you may get they're faster with the revolution. But the Labour Party way means that there will be no counter-revolution. Once it's done, it's done for good. And uh, he was proven wrong. Uh, you know, a lot of us have talked uh, this last couple of days about the extent to which what were thought to be irreversible reforms in the era of Thatcherism and Reaganism and in general the era of neoliberal globalization, reforms that were thought to be permanent and by a socialist who was a social democrat that would accumulate to eventually get you somewhere else, right, have of course been reversed. Now, it wasn't that he was wrong, however, about the possibility of counter-revolution when you had revolutionary change, both in the short run and as of course, we discovered through the course of the 20th century in the long run. Um, as for Marxist revolutionaries, uh, Marxist socialists, uh, you know, it's famously known and, and said amongst the <coughs> historians of socialist thought in Canada uh, that uh, they were very largely proletarians rather than traditional intellectuals. They were organic intellectuals. This is a point that uh, Norman Penner made first in his book on the Canadian left, 
but of course very, very incisively, I think, Peter Campbell has made so well in his book, uh, Canadian Marxists of the Third Way. I always thought it was an unfortunate title, Peter, coming out just as Blair had been elected. Yes. <laughs> right? uh, so it was a bit confusing uh, when we saw the title. Brian's with you on this one. But who he's, who he's talking about, who he's talking about, uh, are uh, the uh, working class, uh, self-educated uh, Marxists, and uh, who populate and lead the Socialist Party of Canada in particular, uh, but continue to have an effect on Canadian politics inside the CCF and CP uh, into the late 40s and early 50s, uh, often in great tension with others in the CP and CCF. Uh, and they're the third way, he argued, uh, because they uh, are against vanguard, uh, and uh, they are not naive about the parliamentary road to socialism. Uh, and they look, and I think they are very inspirational in this respect, uh, and, and Peter makes the case very well, I think, that they base themselves on Marx in this respect. Uh, they look to worker self-emancipation, worker self-development, the development of the working class capacity to actually change the world, which involves workers changing themselves. Um, that, and it, you know, that's not that they leave out the need for leadership, etc., but that's the center of their thought as opposed to a vanguardist, uh, <coughs> what became known as a Leninist uh, formation. Uh, uh, they were mostly British immigrants, uh, like Ernie. Um, uh, and, and Peter uh, studies four of them. But of course, there were other Marxist socialist immigrants uh, who uh, one could and ought to uh, talk about as well. Uh, and and uh, some of them uh, were those uh, uh, who we heard about in Montreal who were creating the Independent Labor Party, usually in individual cities. Uh, and, uh, so someone like Donald Swartz's, my, my co-author and friend Donald Swartz's grandfather, John Bloomberg, who was a bus driver from Leeds, was uh, one of the key founders of the Independent Labour Party. Winnipeg went on to be uh, mayor of the city eventually. Uh, many more of them, though, uh, were influenced by Marx, uh, and uh, uh, I think in particular uh, of Larry Zolf's father, who was my teacher at the Parrot School, uh, the secular Yiddish school that I went to in Winnipeg. Uh, he published a wonderful uh, two-volume uh, book uh, called A Friend the Air on Foreign Soil, uh, which has just been translated, well, not just, then, about 10 years ago, translated by a guy called Marty Green, who's a remarkable intellectual in Winnipeg. Uh, and you will start by reading it in English, but by the time you finish the second volume, you will know Yiddish. <laughs> uh, and Zolf tells the story uh, of himself in 1917, but by 1905, or 1906, uh, after the Kishinev pogrom, there would have been uh, a lot of Jewish immigrants uh, who had been influenced by Marxism who had come to Canada. Uh, he tells the story in 1917, 1918, of, of having this bewildering choice of which Marxist party to join, right? Uh, 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 so, it, someone like him was more turned to the Jewish community as the social gospel people had been turned to their churches, whether it was Anglican, United Baptist, or whatever. He was more, although he was secular, he was turned to the Jewish community. Many others, of course, turned their Marxist socialism as immigrant socialists outwards. Some didn't. You know, remained inside the Finnish community, inside the Ukrainian community, etc. Um, now, if we jump, uh, and, and I would need to, uh, well, I was going to just say one other thing. An, an example of uh, the immigrant who brings with him or her uh, socialist ideas, uh, Marxist ideas even, uh, is ultimately someone like David Lewis. Uh, if you read Lewis's biography, uh, uh, he, he won the Rhodes, uh, went from Montreal to Oxford, 
very much influenced by Morrisonian British laborism, comes back and becomes a full-time functionary in the CCF, the full-time functionary in the CCF. Uh, he thought of himself uh, as a young man uh, in the tradition of his father who had been a Menshevik. And if you read his memoir, he says that my father <coughs> had been mayor of this Polish town uh, as a Menshevik, and the Bolsheviks came in uh, during the course of the Civil War and had actually stood on the against the wall and were about to shoot him until something intervened. And from then on, my lifelong hatred of communism began. He actually puts it in that very explicit way, right? Uh, so you can see this carrying over into uh, Canadian life. Now, if you jump to the CP and the CCF, you then begin to see either the making of uh, intellectuals in a somewhat different sense uh, uh, in those parties, uh, and, and to some extent their role in the making of those parties uh, more traditional intellectuals in the making of those parties. I mean, in the case of the CP, someone like Marie Spector, who was editor of the newspaper, uh, is a brilliant intellectual uh, uh, who looks to me quite differently than the type of people that Peter was writing about earlier in the century. Uh, if you read uh, Earl Burney's Down the Long Table, uh, you see the making of young Trotskyists in the break from the party from 28 on. And the central figure is presumed often to be uh, based on David Easton, who went on to be, of course, the famous post-war political scientist in the United States who, around which systems theory uh, was based. Um, in, in the CCF case, uh, the League for Social Reconstruction, very famously, is one of the key pillars of the CCF uh, in its origins, uh, as well as in its evolution, Marsh, Scott, Forsey, uh, Underhill, uh, etc. Uh, uh, in the post-war era, and I'm trying to get through this quickly so I can get to the contemporary one, uh, there are still very, very few traditional intellectuals uh, uh, who can be said to be uh, socialists, certainly Marxists as intellectuals. I think that one of the reasons that McCarthyism doesn't quite look as ugly here, or the Red Scare, let me put it that way, isn't quite as uh, ugly here, uh, is because there's less uh, traditional intellectuals to root out. And I'm, I'm defining that broadly, to include teachers, let us say, uh, or, or people who had already come into the universities. Uh, that's not to say there are none, and there's some new in types of intellectuals who become communists and become either victims of the Red Scare in Canada uh, or need to hide uh, their uh, associations with the Communist Party, uh, although the RCMP keeps files on them. Uh, I'm thinking of social workers. Someone like Gil Levine, who was a social worker, ends up founding the largest research department in any Canadian union, the Canadian Union of Public Employees, after it merges a, a number of previous public sector unions. Uh, Gil was a uh, communist fellow traveler, at least probably in the party at some point, uh, who, uh, 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 who was a victim of that Red Scare, including inside the labor movement. Right? Um, uh, Roland Penner tells a lovely story uh, of his brother, Norman. Uh, Jake Penner, of course, was one of the founders of the Canadian Communist Party. Uh, and they were based in Winnipeg, and then he had a nice family from Manitoba. And he tells the story of Norman in grade school being persecuted by the phys ed teacher who kept calling him a communist. Because his father was very famous father. Uh, and finally, Norman can't take it anymore, and he knows he's not to go to his dad in grade. So he marches to the principal's office uh, and uh, says to the secretary, I want to see the principal, I want to complain about Mr. So-and-so. And, -so. and uh, uh, the principal comes out of the office and says, what's this all about? And uh, Norman says, Mr. So-and-so keeps calling me a communist in front of the, all the other boys. The principal says, you're a communist? Come into my office. Takes him into his office, closes the door and says, so am I. <laughs> There weren't enough of them. <laughs>
uh, through the, the, the 50s already, of course, uh, the people I was calling traditional intellectuals, there are many more of them, who are socialist intellectuals, especially poets. I need hardly, you know, I think, elaborate on that. Uh, but it's true, I think, much more generally. Now, uh, the explosion of the new left in Canada, and uh, I urge everyone who's even not a Canadian to read uh, Brian's book on the 1960s, uh, which is an absolutely marvelous piece of research and writing. Uh, uh, I found very interesting when I went back to the chapter uh, that would be relevant to this in Brian's book on the 60s, uh, that he kind of makes an interesting point that uh, the fl flowering of Marxism in Canada in the 1960s, of a new wave of Marxism, partly is in reaction to the lack of a socialist orientation, certainly a Marxist orientation, on the part of young people in SUPA uh, or the CUCND, some of whom are even red diaper babies, like uh, uh, Leora Salter, who he talks about in terms of her community organizing, including in native areas uh, in the 1960s. Uh, and he in particular pulls out an article by Saigon, uh, which is probably written with Jim Harding in mind, but he you know, really goes at this. And I think there's a lot of insight in that. I do think that it was partly in reaction uh, to the activistism, what Doug Henwood and Christian Parenti called activistism uh, of much of the early New Left in, in, in Canada in uh, the 1960s, uh, that helped generate, I think, this wave of Marxist innovation, much of which, of course, appears in the universities. And now, and Wallerstein was right about that, and this, of course, happened elsewhere, uh, you find that if you're a Marxist, if you're a socialist intellectual in particular, that's where you end up, right, uh, in the university. It's maybe where you start. It's where you, end up. Uh, uh, you see it in the fact that the challenge to David Lewis uh, in, in, in uh, the NDP comes from a, history, a graduate history student at Queen's University, Jim Waxer, right? Uh, and the waffle was very, very, he very heavily academic. Right? Uh, that's not to say that it didn't have trade unionists affiliated to it, uh, but the leadership of it, the key manifesto, was very much made up of uh, Marxists or Marxist-sant uh, people who thought that the, the NDP was no longer socialist and certainly was no longer anti-imperialist. Um, uh, the flourishing uh, of a variety of socialist thought, and especially Marxist thought, in the universities in the 1970s, uh, I think does need to be registered and reported. I think it's not just a matter of having, uh, in political science, a Marxist wing nor is it just in a matter of, or a wing that does class analysis. It's not a matter of uh, having in history uh, a wing that takes class seriously, wants to look at class formation. No, it's, I think what we were engaged in was trying to make Marxist theory better. It wasn't just discovering it and trying to insert it into these disciplines from which it had been left out. Right? I think that more of the project was that Marxism itself, as we had inherited in our generation, was limited. Uh, limited in terms of historical guidance, limited uh, in terms of understanding capitalism in its uh, current phase, etc. Uh, so I think what we were embarked on was not just an insertion of Marxism, Marxism into intellectual life, but it was an attempt to work on Marxism. Uh, uh, and I think that was uh, true, uh, even of those who were trying to apply dependency theory to Canada. Uh, you know, that wing of uh, new uh, socialist nationalists uh, that uh, produced uh, capitalism, the national question in Canada, or closed the 49th parallel. Uh, 
And when people like myself, who were much more oriented to class analysis, uh, while seeing the importance of that, got into theoretical and historical debates with them, uh, uh, it was, again, with an attempt of uh, producing a Marxism that didn't simply see the ruling class as determining everything the Canadian merchant financier being the explanation of Canada's dependency. Uh, it was a matter of trying to get the working class into the historical analysis to try to get the balance of class forces into the historical analysis. Uh, similarly, in that class analysis, and I was saying this uh, to Russ Jacoby, uh, you know, as we try to explain the crisis of the, crisis of the 70s, not in terms of the inevitable tendency of the rate of profit to fall, but in, in fact, in terms of the class struggles that were squeezing profits as a result of the conditions of full employment and the victories around uh, the social wage, the welfare state in the 1970s, which included then the rise of movements, especially in the women's movement of, the, uh, of others. Uh, uh, we were explaining the profit squeeze uh, in terms of the strength of the working class. Well, the CLC didn't like that much. Uh, you know, they much preferred the falling rate of profit pieces because the bourgeoisie was blaming workers for being too militant, <laughs> pushing wages up, right? That was the cause of the crisis. That's why we had to have wage restraint and incomes policies. Well, if someone from the left came along and said, hey, wait a minute, it's a, it, it does have to do with the strength of the working class. Uh, with the militant uh, nurses, uh, let alone the militant auto workers. Uh, for a long time, uh, CLC uh, people wouldn't let my students into the CLC to do research. Right? They didn't want to hear this stuff, and even people like Gil Levine didn't like it much, uh, because it was hard to handle in terms of, you know, God, are, they're saying we're responsible, and you're saying we're responsible. Um, but I think that was a matter of trying to improve Marxism and probably improve the way in which socialist intellectuals tried to make themselves useful to the unions. Uh, a lot of the unions didn't think we were being very useful. Uh, now, you, of course, especially saw this, uh, I think, in labor with Trevi, uh, with its enormous contribution to understanding class formation, uh, with the way it appropriated uh, Thompson. Uh, but, but I think yesterday's conversation was very useful, appropriate in a way that helped us understand Canada uh, in uh, the 20th century uh, as, as uh, much or more than Thompson understood England uh, in the late uh, 18th and, and early 19th century. Um, those of us who founded Studies in Political Economy and that was the other journal of socialist intellectuals. Uh, the subtitle of which, by the way, is a socialist review. Uh, and those of us who found that it had arguments about whether we ought to be sticking that badge on it. It was going to make it more difficult for the young intellectuals who wanted to give a place to publish uh, to put that on their CVs and help themselves get hired. Right? Joram Therborn, who we published in issue four, when he saw the title, subtitle uh, of the journal was a socialist review and then saw on the in inside front cover that we got money from the Social Science Federation of Canada, said you could, this could never happen in Sweden. Right? You couldn't get money for an academic journal that had socialist in the title right? and get government funding for it. Uh, so I think we saw ourselves as socialist intellectuals and certainly I saw the people who were working on labor literature, not so much as historians. Of course you were, but as socialist intellectuals. Right? That's, what, that's what we were doing. Uh, now, the, I think in many respects, the greatest contribution came from Marxist feminists in Canada. Uh, and yeah, I think the list is long. Uh, Brian puts a lot of emphasis in particular in his book on Margaret Benston, <laughs> Sharon Gattel, Pat and Hugh Armstrong, who's classic beyond sexless class and classless sex in early issues studies in political economy, uh, I think uh, it was enormously important. Uh, you know, one would have to have Barta Burston, Meg Luxton, Dorothy Smith, 
these were uh, different, uh, but profound contributions, I think, coming from Canada uh, to improving Marxist theory. Uh, not just a matter of creating a new field, if you like. Um, okay. Has it all been pissed away? <laughs> there's a sentence. There's a sentence or two in in Brian's book on the '60s, which I found very enigmatic. I think maybe I misread them, Brian. But I think you said that Marxism began to fade in the universities by 1970. Uh, I mean, you may want to go back and look at it. I don't know exactly what you meant. Uh, but certainly, I don't think that's at all the case. I think the flourishing took place, in fact, after 1970. Uh, and I think, you know, with the founding of Labour de Travail and SBE was all a reflection of that. And, and the explosion of Marxist feminist writing was a reflection of that. Um, uh, I think what's also been the case uh, is that Whatever may have happened inside the Canadian Historical Association, or is happening inside history departments, whatever may uh, have taken place in the Canadian Political Science Association in terms of there no longer being a wing of it that's a political economy wing, which I must say, it wasn't Marxist intellectuals who were doing, that was mainly Danny Grage. I mean, we never saw as our object transforming the Canadian Political Science Association. Uh, and now, uh, you know, and for a very long time, our main affiliation inside that annual meeting of the Canadian Learned Societies, as they used to be called, we Canadian intellectuals called, used to call those meetings the stupids, rather than the learned. Uh, you know, it's been, the, it's been the Society of Socialist Studies, where we would have most of our panels. Now we have all of them, because the Political Science uh, Association will doesn't bother with any of our stuff, and we don't bother offering it any stuff. Um, I'm not sure in that sense uh, whether Joan was right yesterday to draw this contrast between uh, what Marxist political economists had achieved inside Canadian political science as opposed to what you guys have or haven't achieved in, uh, in, in uh, the Canadian Historical Association. Uh, but I think another dimension to our success and continuing success uh, you know, has been our internationalism. Uh, if you contrast uh, the Marxist uh, who uh, preceded us, uh, those say spawned by the CP like Stanley Ryerson, right? uh, uh, who perhaps stands out above all in terms of a contribution to Canadian uh, writing, uh, historiography and more uh, uh, as a product of the Communist Party as an intellectual within it, created by it, etc. Um, the international impact of our generation of Marxists has been much greater. You know, the only exception perhaps is C.V. McPherson with his, the impact of uh, uh, his marvelous critique of Locke and Hobbes, etc., you know, the possessive individualism book. Uh, but, but it's been much, much greater. Uh, a true, you know, people like Dorothy Smith as well as people like Brian. Uh, and, and we're read much more widely uh, Harriet than, uh, Harriet or Harriet Friedman, Friedman of course, uh, uh, going back to the Wallersteinian uh, tradition, of course. Um, more than that, I think uh, we weren't passive. Uh, I, I, in, I pulled out uh, a passage, oh, but I'm losing it, from the preface I wrote to the Canadian state. Can you imagine? a book with the title of the Canadian State uh, would become an academic bestseller. Uh, this is a book I edited and, and wrote, in, wrote in, in, in 1977, published at the University of Toronto Tr Tr Press. And it sold tens of thousands of copies, was used in a lot of courses, etc., etc. And uh, in the preface, I said, of course, one must be cautious, no, one must cautiously avoid the illusion that by virtue of its strengths alone, a Marxist theory of the state will gain prominence. The rise and fall of theories is not merely the product of intellectual competition with the most fruitful coming out on top, 
the acceptance of any particular theory of conceptual elements rests on some consensus amongst intellectuals with regard to the importance of the significant problems it identifies. On the identification of those problems, questions of interest as well as objectivity, ideological hegemony as well as academic freedom will inevitably play their part. Most important of all will be the question of whether the generation of Marxist theory <coughs> itself will continue to be divorced from the working class in Canada. For without a working class helping to identify the significant problems by its own actions and taking up cultural as well as political and economic struggle by re-examining its history and developing a theory and practice for, for, for future change, Marxist theory will lack a social base, which is finally the sine qua non for the sustenance of any body of ideas. Uh, so I think, and it, uh, people were alluding to this yesterday, of course, but we weren't passive as socialist intellectuals in this respect. And I think we then need to ask ourselves, what happened to our politics? Because we were trying actually to do this, right? Uh, our generation, uh, and I say this very broadly, even those who went into the Communist Party, People like Frank Cunningham, people like Barb Cameron, people like Phyllis Clark, you know, they were trying to reproduce Tim Buck's party. Far from it. Uh, but it was certainly true uh, of people who uh, uh, sought to find a better Leninist party, most of whom were Trotskyists. Right? And it was certainly true of those of us who very deliberately were not Leninists because of the 21 theses. Uh, in part, because we didn't accept democratic centralism, uh, or, or uh, as Lenin defined it, uh, or the 21 Theses, or dual power uh, as a strategic as strategic guides. Uh, this explains that you know Brian ends up writing a biography of Canon. Uh, insofar as I've written a biography, it's of Tony Benn, Chapter Two of the End of Parliamentary Socialism book. And in both cases, Brian is engaged, as someone said yesterday in a critical dialogue with Canada, and I was with Ben, in the sense of saying you can't change the Labour Party from a lumbering elephant into a gazelle. Uh, but the admiration was there, uh, precisely for the attempt to go beyond social democracy, as others were trying to go beyond the CP, uh, in creating a different type of party oriented to what someone here called today non-reformist reform or structural reform. Right? Um, and how did we do? Well, uh, if you give me a few more minutes. Uh, Two. OK. Uh, <laughs> maybe that's all it's worth. Uh, um, uh, we seeded, uh, certainly those of us uh, who were in the Movement for Independent Socialist Canada, which was the waffle after it was expelled from the NDP. I was, I've never been a member of the NDP. I am not now, nor have I ever been, <laughs> uh, or any other social democratic party. Um, uh, I, and I only joined uh, the movement of Men's Socialist Canada when I discovered there were a lot of working class militants in it. People like Bill Walsh, Alan Mary Campbell, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it split over a, a disagreement between those who thought the American working class were our enemy, quite explicitly, in the case of Bob Laxer, and those of us who took a class analysis of the world, even if we saw the importance of American imperialism in Canada. Um, uh, and when it split, we formed a group called the Ottawa Committee for Labor Action, uh, which built very close relations with public sector unions in Ottawa. Uh, and, you know, if we had any success, it was in seeding a lot of good people in the labor movement. Uh, Rosemary Worskett in the Public Service Alliance of Canada, Jeff Bickerton in the Canadian Postal Workers, uh, and, you know, there's a long list, in fact. Uh, uh, that was less true of the Trotskyists because of their suspicion of the labor bureaucracy, uh, but it was true of others as well. And there has been a feminization of the labor movement in Canada. Uh, which I think, uh, to some extent, we are responsible for. <coughs> now, it also has to be said, as Rosemary has said, what difference has it made? There are a lot more women in positions uh, of leadership in the union. Uh, hell of a lot more women. 
and a lot of sensitivity to the issues that, that women have raised. Right? Uh, what difference has it made in terms of all the things that we complain about uh, with regard to the union? Well, even there, I think we ought to be really careful. Uh, Nancy Fraser came to York, another one that comes to York for a few minutes and says some interesting things. And, you know, in the course of her talk at Osgoode Hall, said uh, uh, the, uh, the labor movement has ever, never done any, anything on women's issues. And I remember Barb Cameron getting up and saying, well, you know, you're not in the United States at the moment. Right? In fact, we wouldn't have win, won, let alone the tremendous victories on equal pay uh, and employment equity in Ontario, major legislation, enormous importance, but we wouldn't have won uh, the victory on reproduction rights, on abortion, without the link with the Ontario Federation of Labor. Now, women did all the work inside the labor movement and out to, to make that link. And they came from the different wings I'm talking about. Carol Egan from the Trotskyists, from one wing of the Trotskyists, Judy Rebick from the other, uh, Barb Cameron from the CP, uh, etc. Um, uh, Mary Cornish uh, from, you know, some crazy Maoist organization uh, in, in uh, the 1960s. Uh, you know, she was the, the labor lawyer who really spearheaded this, uh, Lincoln Buckle between the feminist movement and the labor movement in Canada and those struggles. So there were real victories, I think. How much the labor movement has changed is another question. Uh, you know, people like Gindin in the labor movement, some, someone like Sam, uh, very much uh, shared the non-Leninist, uh, but at the same time non-social democratic perspective uh, that Akla had, uh, and was part of our attempt in the early 80s uh, to create this socialist network in Ontario, uh, which Dorothy Smith was a part of as well, we will remember that attempt. And, you know, people were just being burnt out by uh, having spent a decade or more in the attempt to create a better Leninism or a better Maoism. Uh, and uh, they were of an age where they weren't for sure they were prepared to spend the rest of their lives trying to launch a new party. Another attempt wasn't made until rebuilding the left in 2000. Thousand people came together at Oise, you may remember, incredibly non sectarian, right? Even the socialist feminists uh, were non sectarian in the sense of, at the time of the 83 meeting that Otto organized, socialist feminists came along quite rightly and said, Well, we don't trust you guys. Right? Uh, we really don't. You say you're feminist, but you're not. That wasn't even there in 2000. But that collapsed on the basis of. Uh, not any sectarianism, but on the zeitgeist of anarchism uh, that the anti-globalization movement uh, so much represented. Understandably, this anti-party feeling, uh, given uh, what the failures of parties through the 20th century, the socialist parties through the 20th century, uh, but you couldn't, out of that meeting, you couldn't have an elected executive, uh, you couldn't have individual membership, uh, and, you know, the next meeting had 300, the one after that had 200, and it just got pissed away. You know, people were showing up primarily in order to see who could pay for the next bus to the next demo. Right? Uh, now, I'll just end with this. Um, uh, Wayne, a number of times, has said, well, look, given the limits of what you can do if you get into the state, uh, shouldn't we be trying to do stuff ourselves in society, in civil society. And I think, as someone said, this is a false polarization. Uh, you referred to the limitations of Greece. Uh, uh, and, and I think rightly. Uh, but ultimately, what Syriza foundered on uh, was uh, it, its understanding, as it put it in, in the conclusion to its political resolution, its 20-page political re resolution, in 2013 when it turned itself into a party of an electoral alliance. It said, you know, the party is not a slingshot uh, that throws its leaders into the state and leaves them there. Uh, uh, the party is an element in a multi-dimensional, catalytic, diverse movement of subversion. And 
we will not be able to accomplish what we're promising in this manifesto unless we're able to help generate this movement of subversion. And they did very little to generate it in the months they were there in, in power between the two elections. You can understand it as you walk into the state and you're trying to find out how the hell this bloody department operates, it, especially when it's a corrupt state on top of it all. Uh, but it was that inability to generate that movement right, uh, that I think restricted their own conception of how much society would take. So it, it's got to be the capacity at, yes, a local and regional level uh, to create a, an ability, a capacity on the part of people you're mobilizing, speaking to, etc., to engage themselves in thinking about different ways of producing and consuming different ways of reproducing, producing and consuming. Uh, but there's no way they're going to be able to implement those uh, without being able, at some point, to take state power, to change the nature of the state apparatus uh, and, and uh, shift resources to those kinds of projects. Uh, so I'm convinced that in this irrational, increasingly in egalitarian capitalism of the 21st century, we're going to see repeated attempts to found better socialist parties. I'm convinced of that. I'm not convinced they won't continually fail. But what scares me, I have to admit, and this goes back to the Wallerstein point. Ernie and I and Gindan and Elbo and a number of others are still involved in the socialist project in Toronto. And uh, there are some young, uh, or not so young, and Rapanchi would consider himself young, he's key to the whole project, uh, people who are more organic intellectuals of the type that you saw at the beginning of the 20th century, Rapanchi's one of them. There are some who come as university PhD students to this project. One of them is even American, but admires all this stuff going on in Canada that's not going on in the States. And I keep wondering to myself, do I need to say to this guy, no, you know, stay in the university as a Marxist intellectual, uh, because the odds against being successful in creating a socialist party aren't great. And even though you're likely to be uh, a peripatetic ap academic, uh, someone who won't have a stable academic job, uh, you'll still be earning more. Uh, than if you're stuck in the attempt to create a socialist party. So there's the irony, there's the contradiction. Do you want to say to a young person, be a Marxist in the university? Or do you want to say, knowing all the sacrifices that the people that Peter wrote about engage, engaged in, uh, do you want to say to them, take the risk and throw yourself full time into being an intellectual of the kind that creates a party? Certainly. I think we have to say our generation failed, but we weren't very good at organizing. <laughs>